OK, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to our July uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Training Program. We do these on a monthly basis. Um, while the topics, some of the topics do uh, are repetitive, uh, we do update this uh, very frequently based on new techniques and new methods that the bad guys are trying to use. Um, so, um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to watch these uh, on a frequent basis just because sometimes the content does change. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, everybody's mic is muted in attendance today. Um, if you have questions as the presentation goes on uh, or during a specific section, feel free to type that into chat. We do have uh, someone watching that uh, and uh, we can address those questions. Uh, either at the end of the presentation or if I happen to catch it as I'm going through there, I can try to answer it real time for you as well. So um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Brian uh, Powell. I'm the CTO here at uh, PCA Technology Group, uh, and I'm also a certified ethical hacker. And basically, that's just a, a fancy way of saying what I'm talking about here. I actually have the capabilities to do most, if not all, of everything here. Uh, so uh, it helps to know how to do it in order to talk about it and also protect clients uh, from from these type of attacks too. So, um, so why why are we talking about this? Uh, you can see there's a bunch of uh, businesses and logos on the screen here. These are just uh, recent uh, victims of either data breaches or attacks of some sort or another, where there was data stolen or customer information stolen. Um, so if, uh, you know, obviously there's there's Microsoft's in there. They just recently got breached uh, yet again. Um, you know, they're a big target, so obviously they would uh, definitely be uh, a great victim for bad guys. Uh, you know, the Cash App, anybody that happens to use that, um, that was also breached too. Uh, Okta, Verizon um, all had breaches as well too. So, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, if you're one of those clientels, none of your information was uh, leaked or stolen, but uh, in the event that uh, you are one of those clients, you may want to uh, at least keep an eye on things, uh, with your accounts and stuff, just in case. Um, so again, you know, last year, obviously, there was, there was a lot of cyber attacks that happened. Uh, in fact, uh, it was, you could see the, the statistic there from 2020, um, you know, it exceeded basically 17% uh, over year over year. So, um, and, you know, 80% of senior IT leaders believe that the organizations lack the protection against today's cyber criminals. Uh, and unfortunately, even with those protections, uh, even at the advanced level, um, you know, a lot of times the uh, bad guys end up getting in uh, by, by tricking uh, somebody and we'll talk more about that. Uh, basically, the you know an end user lets them in the door per se. Uh, so basically, it throws all the protection out the window. Uh, you also need to make sure that you know if if you are a company that does any type of compliance or has compliance uh, regulations, whether it's HIPAA or DFS or whatever, um, that uh, you know you're actually satisfying and meeting those type of uh, requirements. And there's also, if you have cyber insurance, a lot of times the carriers now, it's not just to say you have have the protection. Now they're making you uh, prove that you actually have this type of protection because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a business model, obviously, and the insurance companies are tired of paying out the uh, paying out the claims that uh, you know when when companies get hacked. So they're making sure that they actually have the type of protections uh, in place that are necessary to to avoid some of these uh, bad actors from getting in. So, so who's responsible for all this? You know, a lot of times uh, companies or employees think, oh, well, I've got an IT department or we've got an IT consultant company that we outsource to, uh, you know, or the owners, you know, it's it's all their problems. I don't need to worry about this. This, is, this has nothing to do with me. Uh, well, it actually does have to do with you. Um, in fact, everybody on this call is one of the biggest pieces of the cybersecurity uh, out there. Uh, so that's why we hold these to make sure that everybody realizes you are a huge piece of this puzzle uh, because 
everyone on this call are the ones that are being targeted by the bad guys in hopes that you open that door or you open that window. Um, and we call it the human firewall. Uh, so basically, you know, as long as you start second guessing things, uh, you don't just blindly follow, uh, you know, email requests or things like that. And you'll you'll understand as we go on this presentation what I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, that you're you're giving it that last sanity check uh, before something happens, uh, you know, and, and you could potentially leave the bad guy in. So that's really what it comes down to. And this kind of shows you just a graphical version of it. I saw this uh, cartoon clip. Actually, it was shared by one of our clients to us and thought it was funny. Um, they did have a, a, a guy named Dave that that ends up uh, that is uh, not very technically advanced, uh, which was kind of the pun behind this. And I just kept using it because it was pretty funny. Um, so you can see in the one corner, you know, in the boxing ring, you have all your protections, all of your layers of security. And you have, you know, Dave over in the other corner here. And basically, uh, it doesn't matter how much you have in the protection side. If you have somebody that's going to open the door or open the window for the the bad guys, it, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, so that's that's where the human firewall comes into play. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, if a bad guy does get into your system, it's not like they send up all kinds of alerts and and red red uh, alarm bells and stuff like that saying, hey, you know, they're not screaming. Aha, I got you. I got you. Uh, no, they're they're not going to do that. Uh, they're going to sit in your systems and figure out, first of all, who they got, because a lot of times they're not physically targeting the company. They just kind of send stuff out there and figure out what takes the bait. So now they got a real, you know, real efficient out of the out of the water to figure out what kind of fish they got at the other end. Um, so that's what they're doing in your system. They're figuring out what's what's who do I have here? First of all, what company is it? OK, now that we know what company it is, is there any value in this company? Um, is there credit card information? Is there bank information? Is there social security, insurance, uh, any any type of those type of informations? And oh, okay, well, how about their clients? Uh, you know, are they are they a business that support other clients? Okay, well, now let's let's see what. And, and they're in there basically looking over everything, um, and they're doing this in a way that they don't get detected um, easily. So they're you know they're fishing around in behind the curtain or in the dark basically. Um, you know, checking out what they got, what they can use, and they're either downloading or doing things in the background that, that gives them access or actually physically gives them this information that they're pulling off your system so they can do one of two things with it. Um, usually what they end up doing is they try to uh, they, they try to extort you by saying, you know, hey, I'm in your system. Eventually they will let you know um, that they're in there and uh, they'll say, hey, I was in your system. I noticed uh, you've got this huge, uh, huge uh, password database or client database or whatever that I think maybe one of your competitors would be real happy to get their hands on so they can use it in a competitive nature or something of that. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, maybe, you know, I, I don't know, maybe $100,000 might be worthy uh, to, to for me to not actually give this to, to your competitor or post it online or whatever they are threatening to do with it. So they're extorting money. Uh, under the pretense that they're not going to give this information away. The other option that they might do is they might say, well, I see you've got all this information and they actually encrypt it. Um, so what they do is they make it to the point where you can no longer access any of your data. Uh, they've locked it. And the only way you're going to get it unlocked is by paying a certain amount of money. That's called ransomware, basically. Um, that you pay them a certain amount of money in hopes that they in turn will give you the key to unlock this data so you can then access it again. There's also instances where they do both. Uh, they not only steal your data and threaten to, to sell it, but they also encrypt it too. So you've got to pay kind of double uh, the potential fee at that point. So the whole idea behind it is to try to avoid this in the first place and not put yourself in a situation uh, where you've got to go through something like this scenario, uh, or you have a means of recovering very quickly in the event something like this does occur. Um, so we'll talk more about that. So how, how do the bad guys do this? Uh, basically, the, the technical term is called social engineering. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, basically a way of manipulating human behavior uh, to get what they want. Um, and, you know, it's, it's actually extremely simple to do um and i like to 
kind of use the analogy that this is kind of uh, the modern day version of a con man back in the you know the early days there used to be con men or snake oil uh, you know selling snake oil elixirs and stuff that's were supposedly the fountain of use and, and oh well this you won't age with this you take this and it's nothing more than flavored water or something of that nature um, so uh, it, this is kind of that version of it unfortunately um, so so what they do uh, you know is is they just try to manipulate you uh, into clicking on things into visiting sites uh, or, or thinking that something's happening when it isn't happening um, and, th and things of that nature. So, uh, and we'll get into exactly how some of this, this stuff occurs, but it is extremely easy to manipulate anybody, um, even, if, even if you're aware of it. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of those things where it's, it is easy to manipulate folks, unfortunately, so. So some of the most common attacks, obviously we're gonna spend a lot of time on email. Uh, because most of this is done uh, via email and various phishing campaigns and things like that. And we will uh, spend a lot of time reviewing that. Um, anybody that uses social media, uh, at least from the business standpoint, you know, obviously uh, that can be used for reconnaissance. So you can get a lot of information. The bad guys can actually scrape uh, those type of pages and uh, get a lot of information off of those. Uh, everything from who works there, who, you know, a lot of times the followers, uh, and I'm not just talking like Facebook or, or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever, Instagram, those, I'm also talking about LinkedIn and things like that. Um, because a lot of times the actual employees follow the businesses on, on the LinkedIn page. So it's very easy to figure out, oh, well, hey, you know, Jim, Jim's a follower of PCA group. Okay, let's go to Jim's page. Well, Jim's page is, oh yeah, he's an employee. Okay, well, there's an employee, boom, put them on the list, okay. And then you just go right down the line of, you know, potentials. Um, you might find other vendors too that are following certain businesses and things like that. So it can be used for a lot of lot of information. Um, sometimes password list too, because on social media uh, like Facebook and and Twitter, everybody likes to uh, post everything about themselves. So sometimes uh, they inadvertently post password reset information without even realizing they're doing it. Um, and it's done basically through some of those um some of those survey type questions that are out there you know oh out of this list what's your favorite color you know or you know what was your first car or things like that guess what those are all password reset uh information if, if someone happens to get access to your account and they're trying to reset your password so be very very careful what you post on social media you know some of the trends we already mentioned about ransomware and extortion uh, who's behind this? So, you know, a lot of times it's it's third world uh, nation states. Sometimes it's government uh, backed nation states. Uh, like I said, this is a fairly successful business model. So uh, some of the countries realize that they can make a living off of doing this type of thing. So they actually hire people to do this for them. Uh, unfortunately, at everyone else's expense. Um, very rarely is it a malicious insider, but there is some times where where that has occurred. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes the bad guys reach out to somebody that works internally and promises them money or something in exchange for access. Um, and, you know, usually what ends up happening is the internal person ends up getting arrested and the bad guys are off with the wind because he doesn't even know who the heck these people are and never got paid, never got anything. And now he's in jail for something because he helped these bad guys. So, uh, him or her, I should say. Uh, but anyways, that's that's the other thing. And, you know, as I mentioned, most of this is done remotely. Very rarely is it physically on site unless you are physically being targeted. Um, and in most cases, that isn't the case um, unless you're like a huge corporation or something that that would have, uh, you know, somebody locally that that has a reason to target you specifically. So when it comes to web surfing and this is this is basically on your work PC. Um, if, if you have a need to do anything on the internet, please keep it, keep what you do on your work PC limited to business use only. Uh, by doing that, it limits your exposure to certain sites that may end up not being uh, not malicious, in other words. Um, so there are a lot of malicious sites out there that you could stumble upon by, by just whatever, um, you know, doing non-business stuff sometimes. Um, so if you keep it limited to business use, it makes it much, much easier. As I mentioned, stay away from social media. 
um, at all possible on work computers. I know a lot of companies do use social media as an advertisement purposes. Um, in that case, you know, obviously just limit your limit your usage of it. Uh, be careful any, you know, odd links and stuff or any, especially the surveys, don't click on any of those. Um, but, you know, just just limit your use when it comes to uh, any type of social media when it, when when you're on your work computers. Make sure your browsers are updated, uh, you know, whether you're uh, Firefox or Chrome and Edge, uh, uh, Opera or whatever, your, your Safari, if you're a Mac shop, um, make sure that your browsers are are up to date. Uh, you know, most of the time those those uh, browsers have uh, issues a lot of times, uh, things that are found uh, sometimes multiple times during the week. Um, and uh, if you don't keep your browsers updated, then uh, it's it's very bad in a situation where you can have your browser being used as the pivot point for the bad guys if you visit the wrong site. So um, you want to make sure that that stuff is is up to date. Most of the time, browsers will update themselves for the most part. Um, and obviously, to, to do that, you know, the browser has to be starting from fresh. So if you have, you know, multiple browser windows open on your machine all the time and you just close your machine and, and put it in hibernation mode and then bring it back up, sometimes you won't get prompted for those updates until the actual entire browser gets shut down and then brought back up and then it'll say hey there's an update or you know we're updating now so uh, most of the time there's alerts somewhere on the window that says there's updates pending please make sure that uh, you follow those as quickly as possible if you see those type of alerts anywhere uh, because like i said there's there's sometimes browsers are updated multiple times in a week um, and it's very easy to use a browser to potentially get in from the outside uh, if you're not careful. So the other thing too is, you, you know, be, be suspicious of pop-ups uh, and download links. So a lot of times, you know, you might be on a web page and all of a sudden a pop-up window comes up. Um, you know, if it's not a site that you're familiar with, uh, sometimes there could be malicious intent behind that pop-up. Um, and uh, if you click on the, you know, there's usually an X button at the one top or a close button somewhere on there. Um, if you Potentially, if it is a malicious site and you click on one of those two areas, it will close the window down, but you could also inadvertently be downloading something in the background um, without you even realizing it uh, because you think you closed the window down when, you're, in fact, you're clicking a download link in the back end that automatically downloads something. So you want to be sure that uh, and try to avoid those type of things. Most of the newer browsers have pop-up blockers in them, but in the event you find yourself in a situation like that, you can hit Control w on your keyboard, this does work on Windows or, or Apple, um, or you can also hit Alt F4, um, and that will either close the window down with focus or shut the entire browser down where you won't have to click on uh, those areas. Now, we do get a lot of questions about, well, what about mobile? Uh, on the mobile side of things, it is difficult to uh, give you a clear cut answer on that because there's so many different versions of the mobile OS's out there and each one has their own way of doing things. Um, what I normally recommend is actually going into the browser process and ending the app. Um, if you know how you do that in, in Apple or Android or or even the Microsoft mobile, um, you know, I would recommend doing that. That way, again, you're, you're killing that application where you don't have to click on any type of pop up windows that pop up. So um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a, a, cl a clear way of describing how to do that because there's so many variables when it comes to the mobile phone. But and then there's also a browser in a browser attack. That's what BITB stands for. Um, and this is a new technique that they're doing. They're basically leveraging the fact that most people are using uh, like single sign on. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. So basically, you know, you might go to a website and uh, you might want to sign up for the website or, or purchase a product and it's going to say hey do you want to use your google account hey do you want to use your facebook account hey do you want to use your maple or, or your apple or your discord or your whatever um you can log in with that and a lot of people are like oh well yeah hey great i know what my you know i know what my login is for any of those accounts and i don't have to remember uh another password or and website login um i'll just use the one i already know so they, they go ahead and do this, uh, and under normal circumstances, it, it, it's fine. 
Um, but in the fact that you might end up on a malicious site, uh, you could inadvertently give away your account information without even realizing it. Um, and fortunately, it's extremely difficult to detect. Um, so be very, very cautious where you're using these type of logins. And, um, and this is what I'm talking about. So, you know, you might you might visit a site um, and it's going to tell you, hey, continue with your Apple ID or continue. In this case, the Google is over here. Um, continue with Facebook or you can continue with an email address or another way, perhaps. Um, so it gives you the option to potentially log in with an already existing account through single sign on. So in this case, they clicked on Google and then it ends up saying, well, sign in with your Google account here. And, you know, you do that, you put your password in. And now this site is using basically your Google credentials uh, as the authentication method again. So you don't have to worry about remembering a whole brand new set of credentials for a site because this this is a legitimate version of it that that links back to Google um, and will use those authentication uh, means instead of a, a separate one. However, if you look at these two pages, um, this and this would be an example of, of potentially using your Facebook account. Um, if you look at the one on the left, that is obviously a fake version of it. Uh, but if you look at the one on the right, that is the real version. Uh, you cannot tell the difference uh, at all. Uh, in fact, even looking at the URLs at the top section here, I mean, they, they match up identical. Um, so it, it looks like it's the real thing. Um, but this, I assure you, if you put your username and password in there, it's going to send that information to the bad guys, and then they are going to steal your Facebook account um, and anything linked to it. So um, you've got to be very, very, very cautious uh, on where you're using uh, this type of login information. So if, if you're not 100% sure whether the site is legitimate or not, uh, I would not use SSO. I would create a separate login just to be on the safe side. Um, and then once you verify that it is a legitimate site, maybe then go back in and change the authentication method. Um, but this is a technique that is extremely difficult uh, even from the technical side uh, to watch. You would have to look at the back end code of this page in order to even figure out that this is what they're doing. Um, and a lot of normal users don't have that technical ability. So uh, as I mentioned, if you if you have any hesitation, uh, log in with a different means. Uh, don't use, uh, you know, your Facebook account or your Apple or whatever account it's asking you to use. Use something new uh, and then you can change it later on down the road. So here's here's an example of the Google version. Um, you know, the, again, the left side is phishing. The right side is is the real one. Uh, and in this case, the only real difference that immediately stands out is is obviously on the, on the fake one. It has create account. On the other side, it doesn't. Um, but I mean, if you look at the exact same URLs, it's it's it would be the exact same thing. So you still can't tell. It even has the the lock. Uh, for those people that look for that, it's the right it's the right site name. It's the right everything. It matches to a T. Um, so again, it's extremely difficult to tell visually uh, on on how this works. So again, if you run into a situation where it's asking for that and it's a new site that you've never visited or it's not a well known site, um, be very very cautious. Uh, that's that's my that's my recommendation for that. So moving on to the email side of things, as I mentioned, this is technically uh, the most used. Uh, about 90% of the email or the hacking attempts out there uh, gen are generated from email. Um, now it does tie into sometimes the web side of things, but we'll show you where that is. Um, so again, same same concept here. Do not use your work email for personal use. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, don't use your your work information or your work email address for for Amazon shopping, your personal Amazon shopping or your gym memberships or your anything personal wise, do not use your work email for. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of the techniques uh, that are used sometimes are fake shipping notices, fake uh, purchases, notices, uh, things of that nature. And if you are not using your work email for those type of transactions, then um, it is extremely easy to say, well, wait a minute, I don't use this. This is fake and you don't even need to open it. So you, you completely avoided that tactic uh, just by 
not using that work email for personal usage. Um, it's one of the easier ways to do it. Um, the other thing too is that uh, if if you're accessing your personal email while you're on your work PC, it's almost the same thing as you're using your work email for personal usage. So uh, make sure if you, if you need to check your personal email, uh, maybe do, do it on your mobile phone on the data plan, not on the network. Uh, that way, if you happen to open something up inadvertently that is malicious, you're not uh, infecting the work network instead um, and uh, moving moving potentially anything bad into the into the network so the other recommendation that i make is uh this is preview pane so basically what happens here is this highlighted message here at the top uh it basically any message that comes in at the top it basically opens a version of it where you can kind of preview it without physically opening it uh without you physically opening it the software basically does it so the problem with that is is that uh, if there is any type of malicious contents to this email that happened to slip through any of the protection things, you've got this piece of software that is opening emails every time it hits the top. So every email you can see was opened here. That's because at some point that was at the top, that was the top message. Uh, so unless you get like five messages come in all at once, which doesn't happen very often, uh, it's going to basically throw the top one here. It's going to open a copy and then the next one comes in. It's going to do the same thing, same thing, same thing, and so on. Um, so if you're happy, if you happen to be out at lunch and I send you a malicious crafted email that happens to get past all your protections, this piece of software, if you're running preview pane and I know it, this piece of software is actually going to open that and it could be running for an hour before you come back and be like, uh, what is this message? Oh, wait, what the heck's going on? And then someone gets alerted. So, uh, I highly recommend turning this off. Um, and to do so, you basically go up to the view tab here in outlook. Um, and then you'll see there's a reading pane there. If you hit that drop down, it'll usually say right bottom or off. If you just turn that off, what will happen now is, is that this preview pane here, uh, the reading pane will actually go away. And now in order to view an email, you have to double click it. So now you've got that sanity check that I talked about earlier. Um, so you can see that message it says Amazon shipping notice. Uh, what, what do you mean? Well. If preview pane was on, that notice would have opened up by itself. Uh, but now you can see the message before you open it, and it's going to say, well, wait a minute. It, I don't do any Amazon shopping here. So you can just right-click it, delete it, gone. You never even have to open it. Um, so that's that's the kind of thing where we talk about the human firewall level. You are giving it the sanity check instead of a piece of software that's going to automatically open it because it automates the process. Yes, I know it's two clicks more that you have to click, but you know what, sometimes security isn't convenient. Otherwise, everybody wouldn't have car keys for their cars or whatever, or, or key fob if you have a push button thing. Everyone would just be able to jump in your car and drive away without touching anything. Um, and some cars, that is the case, but it's because you have a key fob with you or some kind of identification to prove that you're you. Uh, same concept when it comes to security. You have to be able to you know, verify that, that whatever it is is safe uh, hopefully from, from your standpoint. So here's an example of a phishing email. This one looks like it's coming from Microsoft Outlook. Uh, and the idea or the ploy here is, is that, uh, hey, your password is expired and I want you to click on change your password or click on the change your password below here. Either one of those links I'm trying to convince you to, to click on. Uh, so what happens if you fall for one of these? So in this event, this is not a real email. This is a phishing attempt, obviously. It's made to look like it's come, coming from Microsoft Outlook. And what I'm trying to get you to do is to click on one of those two links. Um, so uh, an unsuspected uh, victim opens this up and says, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose access to my, my email because uh, my password is going to expire. Okay, I'll just click this change your password. So what's going to happen? You're going to click that and it's going to open up a browser uh, and send you to a website that is going to look like Microsoft's site. And I, uh, it's going to ask you to... Uh, put in your username, which is usually your email, and then it's going to ask you for your password, um, and you're going to put that in there, and then it's probably going to come up and give you some type of error message. Um, and, and one of two things are going to happen. Uh, it's either going to redisplay the page, you're going to put your information in there again, and it's going to give you an error again and again and again. It's going to keep looping and giving you these errors. Or the second time, it's it's you're going to put your information in there and it's going to work and you're not going to think much of it. 
So depending on who the bad guy is and how crafty they want to get uh, is depending on what you're usually going to see. So let me explain what happens. Um, you click on that link and it sends you to a site that was set up by the bad guy that its whole intention is to steal your login information. So when you put your login information on that the first time around, it probably was the right information, not that you mistyped it or did something like that or something didn't work, um, but it sends it to the bad guy. It literally, the minute you hit hit enter or log in or whatever, it actually sends that information to the bad guy uh, so they can actually get access to your email later on um, down the road. Uh, the reason why it doesn't work is because obviously it's not the right Microsoft site. So if the bad guy didn't set that site up uh, to be crafty, basically it's going to continue to error because it's never going to work. It's not the right Microsoft Microsoft site. If the guy, if the person that set it up is crafty, what they'll do is the first time it'll be the site that they set up and then they will redirect you after they put an error message up. They will send you to the right Microsoft site the second time. And then when you log in, you'll just think that you mistyped your password or whatever, and you'll go about your merry old way and not think anything of it. Uh, meanwhile, you gave your password and login information to the bad guys off the first site. So how do you avoid this type of thing? It's quite simple. You get any type of alerts on any type of password expirations or anything uh, out of the blue. You get anything that has these type of website links in them. Don't ever click on any of those website links ever unless it's something you just generated. And I'll talk to you about what that means here shortly. Uh, instead, if you think this is valid, you can open up a browser on your own, whatever your browser of choice is, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, whatever. Uh, open that up, type in the Microsoft site yourself. That way you know you are getting to the right Microsoft site because you typed it and then log in. If this is valid, the minute you log in, it's gonna verify you saying, yep, this is you. Okay, hey, your password needs to change. It'll tell you this as soon as you log in. Um, otherwise, you could fall from one of these tactics that the bad guys are trying to click or get you to click on these two links. Um, so that's that's something that's the easiest way to avoid them. Uh, you know, and if, if you ever have doubt, you're one of our clients, uh, you know, just reach out to our help desk. We can very quickly look at the email and verify if it is legitimate or not. But again, the easiest way for you to do that is to simply open up a browser and go to the site yourself by you typing it in, not clicking on these links. So here's another example of it. This is an example coming from a bank saying it wants you to verify some kind of withdrawal attempt or something uh, in another country. Please click on this, this link here. Uh, and, and follow the thing. Again, if you click on this link, what's going to happen is going to send you to a fake site that looks just like the real one. It's going to steal your banking credentials and they are going to empty your account out. Um, so again, you get one of these out of the blue and you're a trusted bank customer, do not click on this link. Um, open up a browser, type in trustedbank.com yourself and you log in your, that way because you know you got to the right site, not one that looks like the right site potentially. Um, this is an example of a scare tactic. Um, so what what happens is is human the human brain has has a uh, interesting way of dealing with conflict sometimes, and it's, it's called fight or flight. So you've got one of two options when when something presents itself. You can either fight it or you can flee it. Uh, those are your options. Um, so you know some people will do one or the other based on their personality and how they deal with certain situations. Uh, so in this case here, this is one of those where it puts you into an ir irrational way of thinking. Um, and it tends to be the, the, the flight part of it is what this is trying to target. So basically this email comes from somebody uh, and it basically it starts out saying, hey, uh, I, I think XYZ is your pat or the, it seems like this is your password and they basically put a password there and the reason why this works immediately is because it's a password hopefully that you recognize that you've used in the past um, that you're not currently still using but that you've used in the past and immediately 
that's what the trigger is. So the trigger, that's that's what triggers you as an individual to say, well, wait, whoa, 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 hey, I know what that password is. What, what the heck's going on here? What's going on? And then you're not thinking rationally. And as you read down through the rest of this, they're basically saying, hey, I've got malware on your machine. I've got video proof of you on on adult oriented sites and doing things you're not supposed to do. And I'm going to blow you into your wife, your husband, your your friends, your family, your employer, whatever. If you don't pay me, what is it, twenty nine hundred dollars. Um, so I can assure you that more likely than not, um, they don't have anything. They're just trying to extort money out of you by using a scare tactic. But this thing works because you're not thinking rationally because they've got you in that fight or flight mode with the password thing up top there. So let's talk about that. How did they get that password? Um, well, again, hopefully it's a password that you have used in the past and not something current, but they've got that password because of two things. One, uh, first of all, if you're getting this at your work email, you didn't follow my recommendations of not using personal uh, stuff uh, on your work email. So they, they've got your work email, obviously. Uh, now that's not to say that this couldn't happen with a legitimately work site too, but they grab your password because their site's getting breached all the time. And the first thing that the bad guys usually go after is password and user databases. Um, what they do is they dump them and uh, they basically they pull them off of the system that they're in and download them to their machines. And then they run them through a password cracking machine. And depending on how strong and how good your password is, uh, and we'll cover this shortly, uh, will determine how long that process will take. Um, so they basically guessed your password. Um, and since they know it's tied to your work email, they're going to send that back to you and try to use scare tactics. So you send them $2,900 for nothing. Um, so again, if you get one of these emails, more likely than not, again, you, you don't have to worry about it. First of all, um, you know, the biggest thing you need to worry about is if that password is still a password you use somewhere still. Uh, you better make some wholesale changes very, very quickly because if they figure out where that login is and password is being used on any other site, um, they've got you. So they can they can actually log in with that information if they ever figure that out. So, but the rest of this is pretty much uh, bogus. It's it's false information, and uh, you can you can pretty much ignore the remainder of that. The other thing that they do too, and this is more this is more targeted. That's why they call it spear phishing. Um, the, the two before, uh, the first one was more of a, you know, throw breadcrumbs in a, in a pond or a lake and figure out, uh, you see a fish, you don't know what fish is in the water, but eventually you'll see a fish come up and maybe grab one of the crumbs and go back down, but you didn't get a clear look, so you're not sure what it is. Um, you know, you, if you get a net, you can maybe figure out what kind of fish it is, but that's kind of that, it's called scattershot, and basically they just send millions of emails out there and figure out who opens it and bites on it. This one here is more targeted, it's, it's more... Uh, this one specifically targets usually payroll or HR, um, and basically it's uh, they've got enough information that they know an employee uh, works there and they're pretending to be an employee. So the idea is, is that uh, they reach out to the payroll or the HR person and says, hey, uh, you know, this is XYZ and I want my direct deposit information to be changed and here's my new banking information. Uh, if you don't have checks and balances in place at your, your company, uh, basically what's going to happen is you are going to come payday. You're going to send, uh, in this case, Shannon's paycheck uh, to an individual that's pretending to be Shannon. And the minute that money hits the account at the, the new account that you change it to, um, it's going to get closed, emptied, and you're going to be out the person's payroll. And the other, the real Shannon isn't going to get a payroll that you're going to have to figure out how to reimburse them for um, because you basically sent their payroll to a uh, stolen identity account um, that was used to pretend it was them. Um, so again, the easiest way to avoid this type of thing, any type of monetary transactions, you need to have policies and procedures in place that verify the individual is making that request. In this case here, never blindly follow an email without physically following up with that person, either face to face, in writing, phone call, or all of the above. Uh, at a known number, mind you, even if you do the phone, oh, well, they could send, oh, well, my phone number changed. You know, oh, let me call you to verify that. And the bad guy sends back, oh, here's my new phone number. No, you, you use a phone number that you have already have on file, not some new number that they gave you. Uh, and if they can't, if you can't reach them at that other number, then do it face to face. It's that simple. That avoids this whole thing in a nutshell. Uh, don't blindly follow this. 
the other thing that they do too is is gift cards. Hey, go buy me some eBay gift cards or Amazon gift cards or whatever. Uh, that's another tactic that they use. Um, so, uh, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next next thing here. But yeah, that's the easiest way to avoid it um, because it looks like it's coming from the inside here um, and it's really not. So the next one is whaling. Uh, this usually targets either either people that are under sea level or, or work underneath a sea level person. Um, sometimes this is CEO or CFO people. Um, so in this case here, uh, this this gives you an example. You know, hey, it's Sean. It, uh, Sean, it's Roger here, the CFO. So this is someone pretending to be the CFO. Um, are you busy? I'm out of the office and I need you to process a wire transfer for me today. Um, you know, and let me know when you're free. So if Sean just blindly says, oh, oh goodness, my boss is telling me to, to do a wire transfer. Absolutely. So I'm going to respond back to, to, to him and say, yeah, sure. Give me the, give me the information and you're going to send uh, whatever amount of money to a Western union that uh, is pretty much unrecoverable um, at that point. And, uh, you know, you'll find out that, oh, wait, it wasn't Roger. Again, you get any type of these requests, Sean better be getting on the phone and calling Roger at a known number and verifying that it is him making this request or physically walking over to him if he thinks he's in the office or verifying in, in physical writing that, you know, this is actually Roger doing this. So he's not blindly sending uh, wire transfers to unknown entities. Um, so. So how can we avoid this? Besides following the rules and, and doing policies, there's another simple way of potentially uh, potentially stopping some of this. And it's really just a setting. If you're an, a Microsoft 365 email user client uh, in their systems, um, we can activate what is known as an outside banner uh, alert that basically you can, it'll actually add this banner here saying that, you know what, hey, wait a minute, this email is originated from outside the organization. Um, it's a visual check. Uh, so you can actually see that this has been uh, the, the message has been sent from the outside. Now, why is that important? Well, if we go back to these last two here, uh, so this is an internal person that is is pretending to be Shannon. Uh, obviously, you know, a, a visual thing, you can see that this email address really isn't legitimate, first of all, but on a cell phone, you might not be able to see that because a lot of times it's, it's blocked. All you'll see is it's coming from this person here, um, but you can see, you know, visually you can tell it's a bad email address, but in the case that you have this external notification turned on that banner, it'll actually have that banner because this message, even though they're pretending to be an inside person is actually coming from outside of the organization. So anybody that's pretending to be someone inside uh, will have that banner on it. If it was the real person, it would not have that banner. Um, because it's actually, it never goes outside the organization. It's routed internally through the mail system. So the mail system would not put that banner on it because it's actually the real person. Um, so that's something to keep in mind and a very easy way of telling, you know, it works for this one. It'll also work for this one too, because again, this, this uh, email address obviously isn't the right email address potentially. Um, so it, if this came from the outside, it would have that actual banner on it. Uh, and you can easily visually see it, whether you're on your phone or not, it would light up like a Christmas tree. Um, now, granted, this will show up for every single external email. Um, but again, it's a visual check that's very easy to say, hey, wait a minute, this is this is pretending or this is saying it's an internal person, but it has the external banner on it. Something's not right. Again, it's that sanity check visualization that the human firewall level can can take take into consideration before just blindly following stuff, so. And then there's another one that they've come out with. So the bad guys realize that, you know what? Uh, some of these end users are getting pretty smart. They're, they're starting to check things. They're not starting to follow our links. They're not starting to do this, they're, you know, and we wanna continue this profitability thing. So how do, how do we pull this off? Well, I'll tell you how they do it. They do it with consent phishing. And basically what this is, is now uh, if they're using applications to ask for permission uh, and basically, if you blindly follow these uh, without giving it uh, a, a look or, or verifying that it's even necessary, you are basically giving the bad guys access to your entire Microsoft ecosystem. That's, that's your email, your files, if you have any stored up there, your messaging, everything that is up in your Microsoft world is 
you're giving them access to if you hit accept on this this particular screen here um, and you're doing so without them needing your login. Um, so even if you have multi-factor, this bypasses multi-factor too. Um, and we'll talk about multi-factor here in a second, but this, this you're basically giving them full blown access to your entire Microsoft ecosystem if you hit accept here. Um, so anytime you get a screen popped up asking for access or permissions, I highly recommend reaching out to our service desk if you're a client of ours um, and just giving, giving the, hey, I got the screen up. Can you verify if it's valid or not? We'll take a look at it and, and at least give you double checks on things to make sure that uh, this kind of stuff is, is valid without uh, you blindly clicking on this thing and, and ultimately falling for a, a potential hack. In this case, obviously it's easy because you can see it says risky app. It also says unverified. Um, if this was a legitimate app, uh, it probably went through the Microsoft verification process. And I will tell you, as of the date today, the bad guys haven't figured out how to bypass that verification process yet, um, but give them time, they will. Um, it's only a matter of time till they do so. But for now, I mean, you can kind of visually check that. But honestly, you shouldn't be getting these type of pop ups except in most uh, most unique situations. And again, if you get one, I would recommend reaching out to our desk. Um, and we can quickly remote in if you're a client of ours and take a quick peek and uh, verify, you know what? Yeah, it's safe or no, it isn't. It's always safe to be sorry. It's better safe than sorry, I should say. Uh, you know, always be hesitant. Don't blindly follow things like that. And like I said, never, ever, ever click on any type of embedded links in any email unless it's something you just generated. And what I mean by that is, let's say you do reset your password somewhere legitimately, and it is you. Sometimes they do send back a message saying, hey, can you verify that you changed your password? Or, hey, I signed up for this mailing list. Verify, you know, that you want to subscribe. Those type of links you can do um, because it's something that you just generated and it's something that you were possibly expecting but if you get one of those out of the blue that's when you don't want to click on it so just that's that's the major distinguishing part and then there's one more uh you know obviously COVID did a number on a lot of stuff and uh i will tell you that uh the 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 qr code is is handy but it's also extremely dangerous uh, and anybody that watched the super bowl uh may have may have fell victim to this potential advertising hack i'll call it uh it was definitely harmless but uh, you know that one commercial where it was just a bouncing qr code going across the screen nothing else except the qr code for a minute bouncing across the screen and i i i don't know why i forget what the stats were but there was millions of people that that scanned that code with their with their phone blindly uh and you know obviously it was a paid advertisement um but uh, in a malicious uh situation they would have gotten a million people uh, to blindly follow a QR code that they had no clue where it was even going. Um, so uh, it's extremely easy to email one of these codes and I can send you anywhere um, because even even looking at it as you scan it, it's not really going to tell you where you're going until after you get there. Um, so it's one of those things where in this case, you hey, listen to your encrypted email. You, there's the code. You scan that with uh, with your thing and it could send you to a malicious site that's going to steal credentials or install software or something. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of companies and businesses are doing touchless menus. So if I am specifically targeting uh, a, a, an individual or a business or something, I can just walk up into a restaurant. They may not even be using touchless menus, but I can drop one of these cards uh, that has malicious intent on the on the table. And uh, until the, you know, the people inside there figure out that, oh, wait, that's not one of ours. You know, I could have a whole bunch of unsuspecting uh, visitors that are visiting that establishment scan that code um, and, and you know send them to malicious sites. So you definitely want to be careful on on what you're doing with the QR code side of things. Um, like I said, there's good uses for it and bad, but uh, just just got to be careful. So moving on to USB and mobile devices, you know, and I'm talking about like the flash keys. I know they're not used too heavily anymore, but the, like the USB flash drives. Um, if you ever find one of those laying around, do not plug that in. Um, you know, if it's not yours, don't plug it in. Uh, it could have a piece of malicious software on it that when you plug it, plug it into your machine, it could run or install something that will let the bad guys in um, later on. Uh, if you do use one of these to transfer files back and forth to work, I know sometimes uh, in the past people have done that. 
uh, where they sometimes take work home with them. Instead of bringing their machine, they just bring a file or something that they're going to work on and then transfer it back and forth at, at home. Make sure you're doing virus scans at both sides. Um, you know, in most cases, your IT provider or consultant does manage your work machines, but they don't manage your home machines. So there's no telling what is on your home machine. Um, and something could potentially hitchhike its way back on that USB key back into the network at your work uh, when you bring it back. So just be aware of that. Uh, and the other thing, too, is, you know, everybody's using smartphones nowadays. Um, be wary of public charging stations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make you paranoid or anything, but there is malicious public, uh, there was malicious charging stations out there. And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you instead of you uh, bringing your own power cord for your phone or your laptop or whatever, you might see one set up at a hotel or a coffee shop or an airport or something um, where you're going to plug into that. In most cases, they're harmless, but there's not to say that some bad guy doesn't go in there and drop a malicious one of those in uh, before the airport people catch it uh, or whatever the establishment is. Uh, and basically it will charge your phone, but it will also steal data off of your phone because it, you know, when you plug in your, your charger, it does charge your phone, but it also turns it into a USB flash drive in most cases. Um, and it, it basically allows file transfers behind the scenes you may not even realize it's happening. They can take your contacts, they can take your files, the photos, they can do all kinds of stuff um, if it's a malicious type charging station. So what I recommend, carry your power brick with you, especially for your phones, if it's a small one. Uh, it's the thing that plugs into the wall, obviously, is what I'm talking about. If you are flying, uh, they do let those on the, on the plane too, as well, uh, as long as it's a small version of it. But uh, it's one of those things where at least then you know for a fact that, uh, that uh, it, it's legitimate. Uh, the other thing, too, is that, uh, you know, make sure you're using that wall brick and don't be charging your phone into your work uh, PC. I know a lot of times they're USB based. Um, but again, as I mentioned, that turns it into a flash drive potentially. Um, and if there is something malicious on your phone that you didn't know about, plug it in into your work PC could infect your, your work network, perhaps. Um, so make sure you're charging your phones in your actual ele electric outlet and not in your your desktop or your laptop uh, USB uh, USB dock. So passwords, we kind of mentioned this a little bit. So we recommend complex, secure, unique passwords. Uh, I've upped this before. It used to be eight and nine characters. Now I've upped it to ten, and I'll explain why here shortly. Um, but it needs to have so it has to be ten characters long, a uh, minimum of ten characters long. It uh, has to have a special character. Special character is an ampersand, an at sign, a pound sign, dollar sign, things of those nature. Um, it has to have at least one uppercase and then it also at least one number. Um, so it has to have at least one of all three of those scenarios and 10 characters long. So a lot of times people say, well, you know what? I'm never going to be able to remember that. Um, how, how am I supposed to remember these things? Uh, a lot of people ask me, do, you know, what about these online password managers? Um, you can use them. I'm not a fan of them because they are huge targets for the bad guys. I mean, the bad guys obviously know, you know, these sites like LastPass and things like that. Um, they they have uh, they have everyone's passwords and and everyone's passwords is stored there. Yeah, it's it's convenient because you don't have to remember them. They basically auto populate and things like that. Um, but there's some drawbacks to it. Um, so you know, so you can use them. Uh, there's about five big well-known ones out there. Uh, but three of those have actually been breached uh, to date, uh, and one has been breached multiple times. So you can see that the bad guys know, uh, you know, that's where the passwords are. So uh, the way I do it, I actually store my passwords uh, in a way that doesn't store the entire password. So for me, I actually write it down in a simple text file. Now, I do store my, my passwords on an encrypted USB key. So... In order for me to get access to that key, I have to remember one single password that basically decrypts my USB key, and then it opens up my text file that I have on there. Um, so uh, what happens to that text file? Well, even if I didn't have encryption on this key, I would not be afraid to give my USB key to anybody um, because I record my passwords in such a way that they don't work. Uh, so basically, uh, how I do that. You could do it one of two ways or you could do it multiple ways, but the most common ways are, let's say I'm using a 10 character password and on my Word doc or whatever, my text text file that I'm storing these on, 
I'm only recording seven digits of that 10 character password. Uh, so there's three missing characters uh, on those passwords. I know what those three characters are. Uh, so only I know what the missing characters are. I also know where what position those characters are missing in. So it could be one at the beginning, two at the end. It could be two at the beginning, one at the end. It could be three at the beginning. It could be three at the end. It could be any variation you want to come up with. But every password on there is the exact exact same missing characters, the exact same missing place. So I don't have to remember everything. All I need to remember is I got to put those missing characters in the correct place, and that is my password. That's the easiest way to do it, because if someone comes across that that list, they're going to try the passwords as it's written, and they are going to fail on every single one of them and give up because they're going to think it's an old list. Um, so that's the easiest way to record your passwords without physically recording the real passwords. The second way is to do the exact opposite. Instead of peeling characters off, you're adding more characters. So in this case, uh, my 10 digit password, I might record as a 12 digit password on my piece of paper. Now, this is a little more complicated and a little more tricky because you have to randomize the characters that you are adding. If you keep adding the same characters to every single one of the passwords at the at the positions, uh, there's software out there that I can use that will recognize that pattern and tell me that it's probably added characters and suggest that I pull them off. Um, so what you got to do is you got to randomize those characters. Uh, you know, maybe the first password has a, an extra A and a B somewhere in it, and then the next one might have a one and a Z or something like that. Don't make those added characters the same, um, but it, it, it does the same thing. So as long as you're randomizing those, someone comes along, gets that list, they're going to try the password as it's written, and it's not going to work. So nobody's going to know uh, your pattern or the characters that you're adding or anything like that. So that's a way of recording your passwords without uh, without physically writing the true password down. So that's one way, or, you know, obviously uh, one way, two ways to, to potentially remember your password. So why is this all important? Because right now, as it stands today, um, you can see here how fast it takes to basically brute force, which is forcefully guess your password based on the possible number of combinations and how fast that takes. So you can see before we used to recommend uh, eight and nine characters, um, but you can see I can guess that even if you're using numbers, uppercase, lowercase letters and symbols, I can guess that in 39 minutes. Uh, in under 39 minutes, I can run it through a piece of software and I will have your password in less than 39 minutes, guaranteed. Um, that's how fast now the technology is out there. So that's why we're recommending 10, because at least at 10, it's going to take five months to guess that password. Now, I could hit it instantly, depending on you know what the software guesses, but to get through every possible combination, it's five months. Now, the idea is, is that hopefully you're changing your password on a quarterly basis. So that's every three months. So providing and giving those statistics, by the time I guess your password at the five month range, you've already changed it and I got to start that process all over again. So it's it's constantly like a cat and mouse game where you know, you're changing your password faster than I can potentially guess it. That's the idea behind it. Now, if you want to be really safe and really sure, you can jump to 11 and it's going to take me 34 years and I'll probably just say eh, it's not worth the time. Um, but that's how long, just by adding a, another digit, how long it takes goes from five months to 34 years. Uh, you know, and I have passwords that are up in the 14 character range. Uh, so you can see it's going to take about 16 million years. So I, we're all long gone by by that time. So I'm not overly concerned about uh, those passwords being hacked. But that's that's the reason behind it. Now, we did mention multi-factor earlier. Um, and I'll speed this up here because we're running out of time. Multi-factor is just an additional layer. Um, it does stop. We have listed here 95%. Uh, it's actually more like the 90% range now, uh, but it does stop a, a good portion of the hacker attempts. And what it does is it basically asks for additional uh, authentication method when you log in with your username and password. So it's going to, you put your username in there, you put your password in there, and then it's going to either ask you for a six digit code that you get off of an app on your phone, or it's going to push a code saying, hey, is this you? And you hit accept or not to your cell phone. Uh, so use your cell phone as a secondary method of authentication. The beauty behind this is, is that in most cases, unless the bad guy has your phone, 
um, it will it doesn't matter if you lost your your password information because this will basically stop them. So if it's not something that you're using, um, it is something that uh, you know we could potentially offer as a, a, a free trial. If it's something you're interested in, you just reach out to your sales guy and uh, we will uh, get that activated for you. So from a public fi public Wi-Fi standpoint, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but what I will suggest is is that uh, be very very cautious what you use public Wi-Fi for. That's airports, hotels, uh, coffee shops, things like that. Um, if what you're doing on public Wi-Fi is not something you're going to walk up to a complete stranger and tell them or show them, you probably don't want to be doing it on public Wi-Fi. That's about the, the easiest I can get without getting too deep into it. Um, so that's about it. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, cybersecurity reminders, uh, you only want to collect the amount of data you need. You want to limit uh, access to systems for sensitive data. Uh, make sure your personal devices are, are secure. Firewalls are in place. Make sure your any farmer employees or the accounts are disabled and make sure your backups are good. Um, that is your saving grace in most cases uh, in the event something bad happens that you need to recover from. So, uh, you know, hopefully this uh, opened up uh, your eyes a little bit on some of the tactics that are used. Um, the other thing, too, is, you know, if you do have any questions or whatnot, you can ask them in chat now. Uh, or after the event, you can uh, actually email them to info at PCATG.com. Uh, we also have some podcasts that get a uh, little more deeper into some of these areas like social media passwords. I do talk about the public Wi-Fi there, too. They're about 15 minutes long. They're audio only. Um, so you could go to our YouTube channel and listen to those. They're very enlightening. Um, I, I talked to them uh, with, a, with a guest speaker who looks at the brain side of it, and I look at the technical side of it, so we banter back and forth a little bit there, uh, but they're, they're pretty entertaining if you haven't had a chance to do that. And the other thing, too, is you know if you're not sure about your security posture, you can reach out to us uh, and ask for a potential free assessment. Uh, if you're not one of our clients, obviously, um, we normally do take care of most of the security stuff for, for our clients. So. Uh, but that's something that you could leverage too. So without that, that's all I got. I thank you for your time. I don't see any questions here in the chat, so I'm going to assume we're good. Uh, again, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. How do you defend against the threat landscape of tomorrow? Reimagine your cybersecurity with the security of one. One platform, one partner, one vision. WatchGuard's one unified security platform brings together five elements that stop threats and simplifies how you deliver and manage cybersecurity. With one partner, you streamline complex processes, reduce overhead, and get the support you need when you need it. Our one vision puts the needs of your business first. We believe in a future where cybersecurity technology is both powerful and simple, and where managed service providers save the world. Unleash the security of one, the one answer to protect your future. Go forward confidently with WatchGuard.